Good morning, everyone. Is it still morning where I'm at? I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> so where I'm at, it's still morning. Um, we will go ahead and get started here as it is 11 and I wanna honor everyone's time, but I expect we'll have more people kind of, kind of filtering in as well. Um, this is our first time um, with our 10 Care Shelter Enrollment Project to do this kind of session. So we're gonna give it a try and see, I wasn't sure how helpful it would be or how, how difficult it is for those doing direct services and family shelters to get away for something like this. So we will give it a try and jump in and hopefully it will be helpful for everyone. Um, I'm gonna, my name is Cindy Manginelli and I'm with the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. I'm gonna share my screen and we will go ahead and jump in there. Oh, Brandon, I can see everyone now, so that's great. I don't know what I did differently, but it's working, so. <laughs> All right, so as I said, my name is Cindy, and I'm with the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, and this training today is made possible by a grant, a partnership between the Bureau of Ten Care here in Tennessee and the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. The Bureau of Ten Care is very interested in um, how children experiencing homelessness specifically are able to enroll in Medicaid and whether they have trouble with that process, whether or not they access the benefits of Medicaid, what all of that looks like. And so they've partnered with us to, to assist in that process. So today's training is sponsored by the Bureau of Ten Care. Um, we'll be asking a few questions at the beginning to that are questions Ten Care has asked us to ask. We're just going to do that and move through it quickly, but that's our sponsor today is, is very interested in making sure that those who are experiencing homelessness, especially children, are able to enroll in Medicaid and access the benefits. The National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, we do um, research, advocacy, training, technical assistance, all kinds of work at the intersection of healthcare and homelessness. So if you've not checked out our website, I encourage you to, to check it out there. And specifically, if you're in the state of Tennessee, we are able to offer 10 care assistance. Um, enrollment assistance, basically anything you need in, in regard to Tin Care, we're able to help. So we uh, are gonna do today, um, we're gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna do one a month for the next few months, happy, healthy children in shelter and in supportive housing. And I was really intentional about um, the title for this series because I feel like um, there may be a lot of thought that when we think about children experiencing homelessness, um, that we're talking about children, families in crisis, who've experienced significant loss, um, really, really what we're talking about in a lot of cases is some of the neediest children in our country, right? Um, and so what does it look like for children in, in this kind of situation who've experienced this kind of loss and this kind of disorientation and this kind of lack of stability what is their experience like and what can we do to help them thrive? And I chose this title because I do believe that um, those of us who are working in shelters, in programs that support children who are unstably housed, it is possible for us to contribute to a happy, healthy environment. That's something I believe very strongly. And so um, my hope is that while we're gonna be talking about fairly heavy things like children and trauma is our topic for today, that um, what we'll be doing is really thinking about our role in providing hope, inspiration, support, um, even goodness and compassion for families, for children experiencing homelessness. And I, and I do believe we have the power to do that. I do believe that is a big part of what you and what your agency are doing. And so we're gonna talk about a pretty heavy topic, but we're gonna look at that from a place of resiliency and, and encouraging strength and hope in the families that we're serving. So um, I'm gonna be talking to you today from my experience. I did a lot of direct services for years and years and years at, uh, in a church for a long time. And then I was a children's counselor in a domestic violence shelter for several years. Um, I worked in a detox unit and a um, halfway house treatment center for women coming out of incarceration with families and, and that didn't have insurance. Worked in a clinic for a while as a program manager, worked with a lot of refugee families, immigrant children um, coming out of um, you know, war-torn kind of countries and situations. So most of what I'm gonna to talk to you about today comes from that experience. What I hope today is that we'll all talk together and be able to think together about how we um, engage with hope, with goodness, with compassion, children, um, who are experiencing homelessness, who are living in crisis. So um, if you don't mind, I'd love for you to put in your chat, in the chat, your name and the name of your agency, anything else that you want to include. My hope is that this will be fairly interactive. I realize that's, you know, that's awkward. It's, it's awkward in real life, <laughs> in a room full of people you don't know. It's certainly awkward virtually. 
So my hope is that um, we will use these times to be able to share experiences with each other, to share best practice with each other, to really um, to think through some of these things by engaging one another in this. I also realize that that can be pretty tricky um, over a virtual setting. So I'm gonna encourage you to use the chat. Um, if you look up, if you go uh, move up to the top of your screen, a, a black sort of toolbar should come down and you should be able to see the word chat and you can put in the chat um, your name, the name of your agency, all of this is uh, confidential. So um, the recording here is just for our own benefit and not something that's gonna be widely distributed or distributed at all. Um, it would be available if you had someone that if you'd signed up and you weren't able to come something like that. So my hope is that it will be interaction in that uh, interactive in that nature. There's also up at the top, you may see a place that says reactions where you can raise your hand, feel free to do that. We are gonna have a few times where we um, ask questions and we'll just see how that goes. I don't want anyone to, to feel like they have to respond. I realize it's an uncomfortable kind of platform in some ways. Um, so I have a few questions again that our funder would, would love to know. These are gonna be confidential. They're even confidential in the sense that I'm not going to associate anyone's answer with their name. It's anonymous. So I, these are just, these are just gonna be numbers that are shared with 10 care without any names, any agency names, any locations, anything like that. But Brandon, if you wanna put up the poll, um, we're just gonna ask, I think it's two or three, four questions, something like, something like that. How many children in your program, how many children is your program currently serving? And this can be an estimate if you don't know for sure, it's, it's in a, a number range anyway. So how many children is your program currently serving? And so that can be, um, if you're in a shelter, how many you have in shelter, if you are doing more like housing, how many, you have that you're providing case management for or support for, however you want to term that is, is fine with us. The second question is how many children in your program are enrolled in Medicaid? So if you are in the state of Tennessee, that would be TennCare. Other states, um, it, it may have a different name. It's probably not just called Medicaid. It's probably somehow tied in, in with your state name. Um, but how many children in your program are enrolled in Medicaid? Number three, how many children in your program visited a doctor of any kind for any reason in the last three months? So I'm including in that vaccinations, um, well child visits, sick child visits, anything like that. All right, thank you so much. We'll leave it open for just another minute and then we will close that down and move forward with our discussion today. All right, as we move forward, um, this is kind of gonna be our agenda for the, for the session here. First of all, we're gonna talk about defining trauma or child traumatic stress, what is it? We're gonna talk about signs of stress disorder in children. We're gonna talk about trauma-informed care and resiliency, trauma in the shelter setting, trauma in permanent supportive housing and rapid rehousing, potential sources of trauma in those two different um, ways that we engage children experiencing homelessness, and then supporting the needs of the child and the family and that balance. And some, sometimes that can, that can be difficult. It can actually feel like a conflict. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about secondary trauma and what it looks like to be engaging children in trauma all day, every day, and the impact that can have on our own emotional health. Um, so first of all, we're going we're gonna to define child traumatic stress. And there are a lot of different ways um, that this can be, this can kind of be framed when we talk, when we talk about stress. You may be familiar with post-traumatic stress disorder, acute stress disorder. There's complex stress and chronic stress. There's a whole lot of different kinds of stress and anxiety that we can talk about. Today, we're really going to focus on what traumatic stress looks like in, in the hearts and in the minds of children. So a traumatic event, and, and to be honest, we're really gonna look at this within the context of homelessness. Um, trauma is a big word. And when I first started doing this work um, a couple of decades ago, I guess, when we said the word trauma, we were really talking about things like war or um, someone being kidnapped or someone you know, being held at gunpoint for a prolonged period of time. When we use the word trauma, it was it was a it was a big T, right? It was a it was a huge issue. Now the word trauma is applied to anything from you know I saw my dog get hit by a car to um, I did two tours in Afghanistan. You know the word trauma is just enormous now, and so we are going to put some parameters around what we mean by trauma. Um, and, but I, but I want to recognize that trauma means a lot of different things to a lot of different people right now. 
Um, but in a more clinical sense, if we think about a clinical definition of child traumatic stress, we would be talking about a traumatic event, an event that was frightening, dangerous, or violent, um, that exposes a, a threat to a child's life or bodily integrity. And for children, that can also mean witnessing a traumatic event that threatens the life or physical security of someone they believe their identity is tied into. So as a child, my sense of, and, and we can do this as adults too, my sense of okayness, my sense of I'm going to make it, my sense of everything's all right is very often tied into my primary caretaker. And so if I see my primary caretaker um, and I think their life is gonna be lost, I think they're gonna be gone to me, they're gonna be separated from me or they're gonna be destroyed or I'm gonna be destroyed. My life is gonna be destroyed. That's really what we're talking about with trauma. And so it can be a lot more than just, I thought I was gonna die. It can be my sense of self, my sense of safety, um, everything that I believe makes me, me, all of that was threatened. That's what we would consider a traumatic event. And so you can see how a child experiencing homelessness, um, that a child who um, witnesses their family, you know, split apart, everyone goes in different directions and they no longer have access to their home. They no longer have access to their bed, um, to their little box of personal belongings. Um, if they are witnessing violence or abuse, whether that's verbal or physical, um, if they're experiencing neglect, which for a child means there are times when they feel very hungry or they feel very cold or they feel very hot and that's unusual for them, that's unusual for their experience. Um, I had a lot of children that I worked with that to be honest, were so incredibly devastated by the loss of their pet that they came to shelter and they didn't have, and they didn't know where their dog was anymore. And they didn't think they were ever gonna see their dog again. And they were devastated by that. This, this pet had been a, a source of support, a source of stability, you know, the one thing that was always there. I had children who felt that way about a specific blanket. Um, I had children who, you know, dad was in prison and mom was with them in shelter and they'd been living with a grandmother that they weren't gonna see anymore. And, you know, the way they framed that was they cried for their blanket, um, you know, all through the night because that blanket had represented stability. So it can include the loss of home possessions, pets, um, an accident or a natural disaster can sometimes, you know, cause a, a traumatic response in children. When we talk about substance use disorder or mental severe mental illness, again, what we're what we're really looking at there is not to stigmatize that, you know, obviously if someone's using substances, everyone suffers, but more to say that if a child's primary caregiver or others in the home are unstable, they're unpredictable, um, their behavior, you know, there's the lack of consistency, whether that's because of extreme poverty or substance use or mental illness. Um, I don't know what's going to happen on a moment by moment basis. And the person who is here that, that I think is going to take care of me, that I think is going to provide for me, I never know what they're going to do. That can, that can certainly lead to child traumatic stress, which we're going to talk more about. What really makes this complicated, there are a lot of things that make this really complicated with children. And it's, it's kind of a whole different category with children. One is that within a family unit, um, and, and if you've ever worked with a family that, that experienced an extreme loss, whether it was homelessness or not, um, if you've experienced in your own family, you know, an extreme loss, then you know that everyone in the family can react to that loss differently. And so what very often happens with children is, um, let's say, you know, we've, we've lost our housing. Um, and so we're, we're, we sleep in the car for three weeks and then we end up coming to shelter. And dad may be really mad about that and feel like a failure and feel furious. Mom may feel really sad and withdrawn. Older mother, may, older brother may blame mom. Younger brother may blame dad. You know, all of these feed into each other. And so even the responses of different family members for the child can be really disorienting um, when everyone's responding differently to find what is the correct response, what should I be doing? Again, that predictability, that consistency. So for children, this often becomes really complicated as they all kind of bounce off each other in their response. Also in a lot of these situations, um, children can sort of learn trauma, like they're being taught hey, we've had something really bad happen to us, you should be really upset. 
This isn't always the case with children. We're gonna talk in a minute about how trauma is very often in the eye of the beholder. So very often I would have children come to shelter that weren't upset at all. I mean, they were, they were really, as far as we could tell, they were totally fine. They, they liked being in shelter. They thought about it like a summer camp. You know, they liked having the kids to play with. They liked having the playroom. They liked having the food. And it was almost like their parents felt obligated or sometimes even staff felt obligated to say, hey, you know, this is really hard. And it's like we were trying to teach them, you're having a really hard time, this stinks, when they didn't seem to feel that way. Um, so we have to be careful that uh, this very often happens in the shelter system. If we require children to go to support group, if we require children to meet with a therapist, if we require children to, to, to get you know, evaluations from a medical doctor, if we're not careful, what we can do is end up saying to that child, hey, you're broken now. Things are really hard now. You're going through a crisis. You're upset. And they may not feel that way. And so we have to be really careful about that with children in a shelter setting. So contributing factors um, would include the severity of the event, uh, the proximity of the child to the event, um, the caregiver's reaction, and this is gonna be huge. Um, how is mom doing? How, if, if the children are being raised by grandpa, how is grandpa doing? Very often, um, and we all do this, but certainly children do this, we, we look to those that we trust, we look to those around us as mirrors. So um, children look into the eyes of, of grandpa or of mom and, and without ever knowing this, this is a subconscious thing, they determine by looking into the eyes of mom, am I okay? Is mom okay? So I get up in the morning and I look in, look in mom's eyes and I realize, oh, we're going to make it. We're going to be okay. Or we're not okay. We're not all right. Right. We do this with each other. I wake up in the morning and look at my husband. If my husband looks sad or just, you know, in despair or worried, then I, then I become worried. Oh, what's, what's going on? What's wrong? We're not okay. Um, and so the caregiver's emotional stability is going to be really important um, to determine the level of, of trauma the child may be experiencing. A prior history of trauma. Is this the first time this has happened or is this, we talk about complex trauma. Complex trauma is where um, traumatic things keep happening over and over. Um, that it, it wears away that sense of the world as a safe place. And this is a really big thing that we want to try to avoid with children is that children can kind of get this idea and this is very dangerous long-term, that the world is not a safe place. Um, I've had children who would um, sit in the corner and just say to themselves, um, no one's coming, no one's coming, no one's coming, as if to just remind themselves that they're all alone, um, to stop looking for someone to help. Um, these were older children, things like that. Um, you're on your own, you're on your own. and and. And so complex traumas where bad things, traumatic things keep happening. And my sense that I'm gonna be okay, that um, in general, the world is a safe place. In general, people care about me. Those things that we really need to be able to believe, to thrive, um, children can begin to question that, especially if trauma is ongoing and repeated. Um, if trauma in fact becomes predictable, becomes consistent, then I just know I'm not safe. I'm not okay. We're not okay. And I just, I just have to, my brain just sort of has to accept that. Um, that can certainly lead to um, a complex trauma response. And then family and community factors. What is the support system the child has around them? Are, do they engage that support system? Um, are they in a community that um, encourages them to believe they're okay, whether that's a faith community or just literally their neighborhood or their family. Um, they may have a strong um, ethnic group that they're a part of or cultural group that they're a part of. Do they have any factors like that to support them in the midst of what they're going on? But as I said before, in a lot of ways, trauma really is in the eye of the beholder. Um, and, and if you've done this work for any amount of time, you've probably experienced that, that you'll have families that you'll meet that have just gone through the, the worst, the hardest time, the most, the most devastating things. And, and mom gets up every morning and she gets everyone dressed and she makes breakfast and she packs their lunches and they keep moving. Um, and then you may have a family come in that, that what they've suffered seems fairly minor and you're certain they're gonna be okay. And this is temporary and we've got this and they, 
you know, one of the parents just cannot function. They just cannot go on. So it's very difficult to um, gauge. It's, it's, it's impossible to say, okay, here are the circumstances the family has suffered. And so that equals this trauma response. So it was this bad, their response will be this bad. They'll need this kind of support. The children will experience these symptoms. That's just really not the way it works. Um, it, it will be different in every situation. And there will be children that you think, oh my goodness, they are not gonna be okay. And they're fine. And there will be children who go, yeah, it's not that bad. I think they'll be fine. And they're devastated. So a lot of this is very subjective and, and why we really have to kind of just kind of keep our finger on the pulse with families and with children to see what it is they're experiencing. You may have all, um, you may have all heard about ACEs, um, adverse childhood experiences. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this, except that it's um, just very, very widely talked about in the area of childhood trauma right now. So I'm, to be honest, I'm really including this because I feel like to leave it out would be to leave out a, a piece of information that's considered um, really relevant right now. My hesitancy with this in talking about ACEs is that I'm, I'm very much opposed to the idea of saying that if a child suffers, you know, A, a X, Y, Z, uh, then they are doomed. <laughs> then they, and so what, what I'm seeing a lot of people do with ACEs is, well, you know, these, you know, you had a terrible childhood experience. You had really bad things happen. So of course you're going to use substances. So of course you're going, to have all these unhealthy coping skills and, and that's okay and we support you in that. Um, and, and almost like it's inevitable and almost like you're, you're kind of doomed. And I'm very much against that kind of thinking. Um, so I, I say this and I, I think there can be value in it. I've seen shelters where they actually talked with parents about ACEs. And I, I think we have to be really careful with that where we're, where we're saying to parents, hey, look at your children have suffered all these things. So they're gonna be sicker and they're more likely to, you know, they're more likely to die early. And, and you have to be really, really careful and sensitive about that because a lot of the families that we're working with, there's nothing, there's nothing they can do in the immediate to remove these factors. If, if your husband has just been incarcerated and you read this, that's like, wow, well, what am I supposed to do about that? I can't do anything about that. And so I think we have to be really careful um, with, as we share this information, especially with families that we're serving, like, okay, realistically, how do we expect them to process that? And what do we expect them to do with that? But if you're not familiar with the, the concept of ACEs, the idea with ACEs is that um, you would have these childhood experiences and uh, basically it's like a test. This, this was research that came out of Kaiser Permanente and other, other studies that were done, but you give yourself one point for each one of these that you experienced. If you're taking the test personally, obviously, if, whoever's taking the test. So if I was physically abused, I get a point. Emotionally abused, I get a point. Sexually abused, I get a point. And the idea being that the more points, that the higher your score on this ACEs evaluation, the more likely it is that you will in the long term suffer um, negative physical, emotional um, health issues. And so um, and so there's a lot of thought around there are people who have diabetes and who have heart disease and who, um, you know, may attempt suicide and, and all kinds of um, issues. And it's not because they have a genetic predisposition to those conditions. It's not because of the way they eat or their lack of exercise. It's actually because of childhood experiences um, from their past and that the long term effect that that childhood traumatic stress had on them. And so you see here um, in this graphic, uh, some of the different ways that, that, that that's processed, this idea um, of how it affects your neurodevelopment, how ACEs affect your neurodevelopment, your social, emotional, cognitive impairment, um, and then leads to um, other health risk behaviors, disease, disability, social problems, and an early death. So again, my hope here and my hope in working with families is to really be a source of hope and inspiration. And, and so that's why with the ACEs, like, yeah, you know, I, I see the, the value in knowing that. I'm just not sure how we apply that as we work with families. But I think it can be helpful to know as we're trying to support families in the social services setting. I had a family um, that I worked with. Uh, you know, there's some families you can just remember exactly what, what everyone in the family looked like, you know? And I had a, a family that came in um, when I was working in the DB shelter and it was the mom and three boys, um, three-year-old, 
seven-year-old, 11-year-old. So they were a little spread out and um, they lived in a very rural setting and they came to shelter. They'd never been in a shelter before, um, but dad was um, a, a psychopath. He'd been diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder at that time. You know, we use the word psychopath more than, than the personality disorder, but he found pleasure in causing people pain. And, um, and so he had done just unbelievable things. And mom was adamant that she was not gonna get divorced. She believed that divorce was, uh, was just absolutely wrong in any situation. And so she was really, um, she was really at a loss at what to do. Um, he would, he would, um, he was a phlebotomist and so by trade. And so he would draw his own blood in a needle and then put that blood in different places on his body uh, he would put it like in his ears and he would tell the boys, you know, your mom's behavior is killing me. You know, look, I'm bleeding. And it was like, that was just awful. It was just awful. Um, what the boys had seen and heard and, and they were so confused. So when they came to shelter, she was very well read and she, uh, they'd been there for about a week and she introduced herself to me and she said, I understand, you know, you run the children's program here. And I said, I do. And she said, I'm I'm sure that you um, really practice trauma-informed care and that you're very, you know, up, you know, that all of that's very important to you. And I said, oh yes, absolutely. She said, can I just, can I just tell you something? She said, please don't tell my children that they're traumatized. Please don't tell my children that they are weaker or less than or more vulnerable because of the terrible things that they've seen. Please help them to believe that they'll be stronger, that they've come through something. She said, this is the family we have. I don't know what to do. I don't, I don't know what to do. But I do know that I believe my sons can be strong, capable, competent men, even though we were experiencing these things together. And that's what I need them to believe. That conversation had such an impact on me. Um, it had an impact on me as I is I was really challenged to think about, do I look at the children that I serve and the families that I serve and feel like they are uh, weaker, they are, um, you know, that, that they are kind of doomed in a way, or do I look at them and, and feel like, you know, what strengths will they have because of what they've seen, because of what they've been through? And the realization that there is a balance there and we've had times in the history of social services where we have swung one way and said, hey, buck up and you can do anything and get through that, you know, and, and, and then we can't have times where we swing back the other way and go, oh my goodness, you're a victim and you're never gonna be okay. And I do believe there's a balance there um, and that the children that we serve, the families that we serve in many ways will be looking to us and, and looking to us to determine are we, are we gonna be okay? Are my kids gonna be okay? Are they gonna make it through this? And so we can take all of this information about adverse childhood experiences and the effects of trauma, the long-term effects of trauma. And um, that can give us a very, a very negative frame for the work we're doing and the children that we're serving. I do believe there's also a, a place there to really look for resilience and strengths. And so that's what I wanna talk about as we move forward here. And I want us to be really aware of as we think about the families that we serve. So let's talk, talk about um, physical symptoms of, of stress in children experiencing homelessness. So these would be signs, these would be behaviors, physical symptoms, emotional symptoms that would seem to indicate that the children you're serving are suffering from the effects of traumatic stress. Some of this you can't do anything about except to understand um, this is what's going on and how do I support the family? How do I support the child? The inability to regulate their mood, to self-regulate. Um, we had children who would be literally bouncing off the walls and then um, they may sleep for three days. And, you know, we don't, as a general rule, children aren't diagnosed with bipolar disorder. That's not how bipolar disorder works, but people would say that, oh, they're so bipolar. And the reality is they've lost the ability to regulate their emotions and to regulate their mood. Um, which of course is, is very um, complicated in the classroom. Depression, anxiety, attachment issues. You may have children who seem to have no real attachment to their parent 
or to the other members of their family because they've lost that ability to trust someone, to take care of them, to confide in someone, to be vulnerable to someone. Um, or you may find the opposite where a child becomes extremely attached to you when they don't seem to be attached to anyone else or an, an unhealthy level of attachment. Um, I had children that I would meet the family and I would go in to do intake with the children and the toddler would run up to me and sit in my lap and would, and would cry and cry when I left. Like, that's not a healthy attachment. They just, they just met me or they were like that after, you know, after one session. So um, an inability to have a, a really healthy sense of attachment. <clears throat> that constant fear, um, maybe a very pronounced fear that mom's never coming back or dad's never coming back or, um, or just a certainty that they're not coming back. And so I, I don't have any expectation that I'll ever see them again. Every time they walk out of the room, that's it, they're gone. Just a really unhealthy sense of attachment. And that can cause a whole lot of complications in the relationship later. Regression in skills or development. So children who were potty trained, but once they come to shelter or they get housed, they're not anymore. Or they stop speaking um, or they stop um, reading, you know, regression in skills nightmares or intrusive thoughts. You may have a child uh, who, you may have children who aren't sleeping or children who just seem to be kind of staring at, staring off into the distance as if they're suddenly remembering things or seeing things um, that they're just kind of lost in their own world. That can certainly be a sign of traumatic stress in children. Changes or unhealthy patterns regarding eating, sleeping, bathroom habits, or hygiene. Um, if children aren't, and this is true of people of all ages, if they're not eating and sleeping, we've got a problem. You, you cannot grow, you cannot survive if you don't eat or sleep. Um, we also would have children who would, who would suddenly eat way more um, and were using food as a way of coping to a point of, of it potentially being really dangerous or who were sleeping all the time. And so uh, bathroom habits, again, you may have older children who don't seem to be able to control their bowels anymore or who are incontinent, who are bedwetting. That can be a real sign of traumatic stress in children. Um, children who are no longer bathing or brushing their teeth or changing clothes, um, who suddenly don't have any interest in their appearance or their hygiene. Um, risky behavior. This was something we saw a lot um, in children in shelter was risky behavior. Maybe they would try stealing something or um, uh, try um, going into parts of the building they weren't allowed to be in or um, you know, interfering with staff, sneaking into places, um, anything that what we're really talking about here is the need to feel in control, the need to feel powerful. A child in shelter, um, a child who's being put in housing very suddenly, um, you know, I was homeless, we're in our car, and now we're in this place, or a child that's in shelter, you'll very often see just that need for any ability to demonstrate control. Um, can, can anything that I do impact my surroundings? Um, the need to feel powerful. Um, we did this, uh, this is a little bit of a graphic example, but we had a, um, in the uh, shelter where I worked, one of the shelters where I worked, we had a, a large playroom. And so we would constantly have toys that were ripped apart. Anytime we got any kind of family toy, the dad's head would be ripped off. The dad would be disintegrated. You know, they were just taking out, this was a domestic violence shelter for women and children. And so just the toys just suffered terribly. Um, but we, one of the staff above me had an idea of putting a suggestion box in there because there was just obviously this need to, you know, just to completely disregard any rules or guidelines. I just, you know, the need to be able to uh, express myself and, um, so we put a we put a comment box in the playroom. We had a lot of teenagers at the time, a lot of older children said, hey, if you have any suggestions we want to know, you can put them in the comment box. And one of the children defecated in the comment box. And to me, it was just this clearest example of I have no ability to make an impact. I have no control. You know, you uh, everything you, you you give us these token little things, just that just that anger, that rage over. Um, none of this is mine. None of this is permanent. None of this is, you know, I don't know why I'm here, um, that need for control. Uh, some children will withdraw. Uh, those be kind of very much in their head. Um, some children will be very aggressive. Um, some children, and we would see this especially with um, infants, would be extremely well behaved, where infants just don't cry, where toddlers don't cry. And 
and we would have volunteers come into the program and they would say, oh my goodness, the, the babies here are so well behaved, they never cry. And, and the reality was they didn't cry because they didn't think anyone was coming. Crying wasn't effective. And so a child, especially a young child who's extremely well behaved, who never cries, who never wants anything, can actually be a real sign that that child is experiencing traumatic stress. Um, children who, um, you know, they just don't want to cause any problems. I don't want to make anything harder for mom. I don't want to make anything harder for dad. I'm going to just try to be really, really good so that I never need anything, which as a child, of course, is, is very difficult because by very nature of being children, they're dependent. Um, sometimes children will function as the leader of the family where they realize, okay, mom and dad have shut down. And so I'm going to have to take over and they'll start making decisions for the family, reminding everyone that it's time to go eat, um, reminding everyone of appointments, um, you know, trying to keep the house clean, um, trying to be very, very good, trying to be the leader, trying to hold everything together, which is, is not a child's role in the family and place in the family. And then sometimes you'll see children who will just absolutely live in fantasy. Um, they'll just sort of create this fantasy world in which they live uh, because they can't cope with the real world where they are. Um, one real clear example of this is I, I had a little girl who was four and she, um, she said she was a princess and she was absolutely living in a castle with everyone was her subjects. She, she made herself a sort of wand and a crown <clears throat> and she called herself the princess and she wanted everyone else to call her that. And she just created this world around herself that she could cope with and where she had control. And at first you might think, oh, it's just kind of a cool little make-believe game, but it was 24 seven and she really wouldn't deviate from it. And so sometimes children will do that and you'll just kind of realize you've kind of made your own world here. Does anyone else have, and you can unmute yourself, um, or um, put it in the chat, does anyone else have any other signs that you've seen in children that they're having a hard time coping? I just listed a whole lot. What are some other signs that you've seen, things that you've seen children do, or maybe examples of some of the things that I've said that would seem to indicate, yeah, we are not, this, is, this, is, this, this child is really struggling to cope. Something that I've seen um, with the families I work with is um, issues at school, um, which is pretty obvious. Um, and the parents will be like, "Like, oh, why is he why is he home right now when he should be at school?" And they'll be like, "Oh, he got suspended for this." Um, and even though he acts great at the shelter, um, I feel like that usually shows something else is going on. Yes, that is a huge indication of something going on. And it's interesting that you pointed out, which I think is a really good point that he's fine at the shelter, but his behavior is bad at school. Um, and you'll see that sometimes with children in trauma. Like once I get out of here, once I get away from mom, once I get away from the situation, then I'm really gonna, you know, I'm really gonna act out. And sometimes you'll see that reversed where kids are great at school. They feel all the support at school, but when they come to shelter, it's like, what in the world? Um, yeah, that, but yes, uh, poor grades, suspended, um, in a, just inability to do schoolwork, lack, lack of interest in schoolwork, lack of interest in any extracurricular activities, that can certainly be a big sign, especially if that's a change in that a child is not doing well. What else? We tend to see a lot of kids with um, physical health issues. So, you know, health issues that um, when they come in, you know, they get sick or, and just kind of stay sick or one child gets sick and then it moves to the other and the other and, um, you know, have a hard time really staying healthy. The, their physical health is, it seems to really be downhill and it's hard for us to, to get them to um, realize, I guess, the association of that sometimes with the trauma and trying to help them really um, work through the trauma so that they can also work through their physical health. That is an excellent, excellent point. Yeah, I remember, it just seemed like everyone always has a runny nose, right? Like why does everyone always have a runny nose? Like everyone's got sort of this low grade cough and it's like, everyone looks exhausted. Um, I had children who really struggled with constipation and they just, they weren't using the bathroom while they were there, which caused major problems. But yes, that, that's an excellent point. Just this, um, everything's, kind of, everything's kind of falling apart. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. Anything else?
I did a very unofficial study one year um, in the job that I currently have. I um, go from shelter to shelter and meet with families. And so one year, um, I was just shocked. And this was the case when I was working in shelter too, at how many children were, were diagnosed with ADHD or as being on the autism spectrum disorder. I mean, it was just shocking to me. So one year, this is very unofficial, but I decided every time I meet with a family, I'm going to, um, I'm going to every time I meet with a child, I'm going to put a slash mark on a piece of paper for every child I meet with this year. And if the, if the parents tell me that the child has been diagnosed with ADHD or autism spectrum disorder, I'm going to make the slash red. That's it, that's my, that's my study for the year, just out of curiosity, very, again, very unofficial. I did that for a year. At the end of the year, um, I had met with about, if I recall correctly, it was about 112 children, um, you know, many families, 112 children. And 92% of the marks were red. 92%, 92% of the children, this was in shelter, of the children that I had met with were diagnosed with either ADHD or autism spectrum disorder. Statistically speaking, that is absolutely impossible. There is no way, there's no way that many children could be ADHD or have autism spectrum disorder. But if you look at these symptoms that I've just identified, then you will see that a lot of these symptoms are the same symptoms uh, that you would see in a child with ADHD or autism spectrum disorder. And so what's happening very often is that these children are going to school, the teacher, uh, the school is saying, hey, we think there needs to be an evaluation and mom and dad are not saying, well, just so you know, when you do this evaluation, um, we're homeless and uh, he saw, uh, you know, we've been sleeping in a car for six months and the car has been broken into four times and he's lost three pets and he hasn't seen his grandparents in two years. They don't, they don't share all that with the school system. And so very often, very often we see children diagnosed with these really significant behavioral health issues for which they're given really strong medication uh, when what they're really suffering from is traumatic stress. This to me um, is just, a, a, a huge issue to me is how children experiencing trauma are diagnosed and then medicated and then put in special programs and the expectations. I mean, I had children that were diagnosed as autistic because they didn't speak and they didn't speak because of the trauma they were experiencing. They didn't speak because of the total chaos they had, they were living in. Um, and yet once a child, once your parent is told, once the school system is told, yeah, this child doesn't speak, the expectation, the number of people talking to that child, the number of people asking that child questions pretty much bottoms out. And so that, that becomes self-fulfilling. So it's another big issue, but something that's really important that I think some of, some of us, some, some of you, some of your programs are maybe the only ones who can say, as you get them evaluated, does the evaluator know about the tra this trauma they've experienced? And I realize that's a hard, uh, a hard conversation to have with parents, but may be really valuable too. So let's look at some signs that are very serious things. That, okay, we, the things that we just mentioned, we can get pretty used to seeing. We can get used to seeing those every day and get kind of like, yeah, that's, that's how the children here act. Um, but certainly there are times when we have to go, wait a minute, we've got to do something, right? This is, this is serious. This could be life-threatening. This child is experiencing a, is a, is experiencing a response that could, that could be um, deadly, that could have long-term effects. Um, when I first started doing this years ago, we never talked about suicide in children. I mean, just it just wasn't just wasn't a topic. It was unthinkable that a ten year old would commit suicide. We would talk about all these all these signs of stress, but we would never consider that. Um, the last few years, I believe, the last three years, for the first time in in Tennessee, in, in the first time in our state's history. Suicide, there were months of the year where suicide was the number one cause of death between 10 and 18 year olds. The number one cause of death. When I started this, it would have been somewhere in the 20s. Um, it was just unthinkable. Um, a lot of people believe that social media has, has impacted those numbers. Um, the, the increase in um, very risky games that that mimic suicide games where you try to hang yourself or you try to drink something that's poisonous um and then that you know that very clearly looks like suicide um a lot of different factors here the the um the representation of suicide in music and movies and again a lot in social media 
So this is something that we didn't talk about with children's, um, you know, with activity counselors or children, children's programs directors 15 years ago that we are now talking about often. And that is that we need to take, um, we need to consider suicide, the signs of suicide um, and take them very seriously, even in children as young as 10, giving away possessions. Um, talking as if um, as if they're done or as if there is no future or as if they don't have to make any plans or they won't be here for future plans. Always ask questions. Um, why do you say that? Are you thinking about killing yourself? Um, asking that question can seem awkward, especially with children. Um, asking that question does not make it more likely to happen. And so this may be something important to role play with your team and to think about in that regard. Homicidal ideation too is not something we would normally have thought about. It is not um, the same level of severity that suicide is, but still something to be taken very seriously if a child. And sometimes children can say this in anger, but always something to follow up on, to, to talk more about, to ask questions, to talk to mom, dad. If a child's saying they're gonna kill someone, I wish this person would die, especially if it's someone they have access to, some, if they have a plan in mind, both with suicide and homicide, is there a plan? Um, do they ha have the ability to fulfill that plan? Um, is it a viable plan? Are there timelines given? Are dates given? Are times given? These are huge red flags. That means great thought has been put into this. Um, I had a child, a, a teenage girl, um, who was in our shelter several times, and um, um, bless her heart, just just a sad story, um, even just in remembering her, I can picture her face, but she, um, she, while she was in our shelter and we just stumbled upon this, she had a map of her school and she planned um, a, a school shooting. She had, she had the, she'd spent hours on it. Um, she made videos about how she was gonna do it. She did not have access to weapons. Her plan to get weapons was not viable, but she spent hours planning it. And so that was something we had to follow up on. We had, we had to make movement on that. Um, so a child who runs away or who says they're going to run away, that's, that can be a big, again, that sense of control. I don't know where I am. I don't know why I'm here. You know, that sense of control uh, and just say they're going to run away. Of course, even if they don't get very far, it can be very dangerous. We talked about risky behavior, but if it is dangerous, risky behavior, things that, that could actually kill, that could actually kill that child or someone else. We had children who would jump off the stairwell and on metal steps or, um, you know, run into traffic or things. Again, I want that sense of power. I want that sense of control, but that can be really life-threatening if, if what they're doing is dangerous. Extreme changes in sleeping or eating, where they're never sleeping or they're never eating, or they're always sleeping or they're always eating. Um, to be really aware when children are playing and to take seriously, what are they playing? Are they, what are they drawing? Um, what are they, what are they role playing? And if it's, you know, especially themes around death or torture, if it's sexual in nature, um, these are things to be taken very seriously. Again, that's what they're processing through their play there is, is that something we need to make some, we need to have more conversation. We need to think about intervention. Um, and obviously we would all know signs that the child's being physically a sexual or sexually abused, signs of actual neglect. And then this is something too, and Wendy alluded to this, um, signs of illness that may be hidden, especially now with COVID, but this was an issue before. A lot of times children don't want anyone to know they're sick because they're afraid if I'm sick, we'll get kicked out. Or if I'm sick, I'll make things worse. Or if I'm sick, uh, dad will hit mom. Or if I'm sick, mom will drink more, you know, whatever. Very often you'll see children in crisis who absolutely will not reveal that they're sick. And so we had children um, suffering from major illness and communicable illness that weren't sharing with us because, because of those reasons. So keeping an eye on all of that and remembering that when mom and dad are in crisis, they may not be thinking of any of this. this they may just be trying to survive. How are we going to get out of this? And so you may be, your program may be the only ones who are keeping an eye out for these kinds of things and even aware of these kinds of things. And so not just assuming, you know, I know mom heard that too, so I'm sure we're fine, but really taking that seriously, even though it's awkward and uncomfortable. So all of this to say, um, sometimes when, especially if we're in a program where we're serving a lot of children, we're serving a lot of families, we're in group settings and activities, and transportation where there's lots of kids, we can just kind of overlook a lot of these things. And so just being more aware, um, is this just, wow, these kids are just awful today, <laughs> you know? And anytime you work in a program with children, you can have that feeling. Um, but is this bad behavior? 
or is it actually a response to trauma? And how do I respond given that very real possibility, right? Um, as, as much as possible, allowing the children in your program to express themselves. So many children I worked with, especially those who had experienced complex trauma, you know, they'd been in and out of shelter their whole lives. They've been in and out of the foster care system. They'd been with, you know, 15 different caregivers. They lacked the ability to express themselves. One of the first questions I would ask children, hey, what's your favorite color? I don't know. What's your favorite food? I don't know. They were unable to uh, express themselves in even those simplest ways. And you would see this a lot with adults in trauma as well. Uh, and so encouraging them, what did you like? What do you want? Which crayon do you want to use? What color do you want to make it? Um, what game do you want to play? As much as possible, choices, choices, self-expression. Who are you in there? What do you prefer? What do you love? What do you hate? What are you scared of? As many ways as possible that they can answer those questions over and over and over so that they have to figure out who they are and express who they are in whatever age appropriate way you can do that. As many choices as possible. Can they choose what they eat? Um, and which I realize with children is tricky. Can they choose what they wear? Can they choose where they sleep? Can they choose what they play with? So many children in crisis, they don't get to make any of these choices, right? So how can we create an environment where they get to express themselves, even in the simplest little ways where they're making as many choices, they have as much personal power as possible. That when you say something, man, I perk up. When you say something, I listen. I wanna hear what you have to say. Your voice is important, it has power as many ways as possible, that all the staff can reinforce that, that all the staff can reinforce that. A big way that we can help a child to feel powerful and in control is through safety planning. We'll do another uh, talk on safety planning, but safety planning is huge. Well, if grownups are fighting, where can you go? You know, to help them think through those scenarios that are scary without making it too personal. Um, so as much as possible, how can I make you feel like even when the scary things happen, you have some power. Um, being very careful about what are we reading? What kind of books do they have access to? What are they watching? What are they playing? What are they drawing? <clears throat> I was just amazed sometimes at how many children's books we would get children's books in and how many books, um, you know, would be about fighting, which I have five children, you know, they read books, we, we role played all of that, but it is different um, it is different when you have a child whose life is characterized by violence. Um, we watched the movie and this was just an oversight on my part. I remember we had all the kids one time in the, in the uh, TV room and we, we'd been playing all morning and we were going to watch the movie and there was a new movie out. It was uh, Disney's Brave. It looked really cool. I had, I had seen it and this just, I just totally missed this. But I put the movie in and in the movie, the mom turns into a bear. It's a cool movie. Mom turns into a bear. And at one part in the movie, the dad attacks, you know, is, is attacking the bear, not realizing it's the mom. And the whole room fell apart. People, children were rocking back and forth. Children burst into tears. One child that was in front of me just looked at the kid next to him and punched him in the face. I mean, it's like all of a sudden, I had the same uh, problem once I took a, a group of the children to the library and uh, they were doing folk tales. And they did the story of, I think it was John Henry, who was the steel driving man. And this guy comes out and he's holding this big hammer. It's a, it's a huge man. He's in character and he's holding this big hammer. And the kids I brought went nuts. They just fell apart. And it just didn't occur to me, you know, in a simple children's story, that's going to be, that's going to be traumatizing. They've seen this in another setting where it wasn't a safe story for them. So just being aware of that if I'm working with children who've experienced these kinds of scenarios and, and in which violence has been very real, how can I mitigate that? How in, in, in our play, can we give room to talk about that, but I don't force those images upon them unexpectedly. Um, and then I find you have to be really careful with unsupervised playtime. Because again, you may be having a lot of children. And so we have this playroom, we go, all the children can go play while we do group. And uh, you've got children who are engaging in risky behavior, children who are acting out as a way of feeling powerful, and that can just be a disaster. So to really think about any unsupervised playtime that you have. So let's talk about, uh, so we're talking now about reducing re-traumatization. And I think we all know that um, 
suddenly moving and even even permanent supportive housing, um, even rapid rehousing, depending on, on how that's done, what that looks like, certainly in a shelter context. Uh, there's the opportunity for re-traumatization that children will see things in a shelter that in and of themselves are terrible, right? Um, and we go to so much effort to try to keep that from happening. But I had children um, in the years that I worked in shelters, I had children who purchased drugs in shelter that were exposed to drugs in shelter, who saw people arrested, who saw people have seizures, um, and, and in that way, shelter in itself was traumatizing. And, um, and sometimes it's very hard to eliminate all of that. But to be aware of that and to provide ways for children and families to debrief after that. Um, and, and how do we correctly handle trauma um, even when it's happening here on our own campus and, and there was nothing we could do about it. One of the big issues, one of the big ways that, that shelter in itself or even maybe permanent supportive housing can be traumatizing is because there's no context. Um, if you think about a child, what a child sees on TV, what a child hears about at school, what his friends at school talk about, the books she reads, there's no real context for what a shelter is. Have you ever had a child come to shelter and they had no idea where they were, or they thought they were someplace different. Has anyone had that? Anyone had that experience? I had kids who came to shelter and because the police brought them to shelter, they thought they were in prison. They were confident they were in prison. I had moms who told kids that they were in a hotel. I had moms who told kids they were on vacation. I had kids who were told they were at summer camp. There was no, um, and, so, and so in some of those situations, they had assumed things that weren't true. And in some of those situations, they were specifically lied to. Um, but when you tell a child you're in a shelter, there's no real context for that. They've not seen that on TV. None of their friends talk about that. None of their other family members talk about that. It's, it's, a, it's, like, a, it's like an alternate universe. <laughs> there's no context for it. There's no, what does that mean? I'm in a shelter. You can't go talk to your teacher about that. And, and children seem to kind of know it's not a good thing. It's something to be embarrassed about, it's something to be ashamed of. It means we've done something wrong. And so in your, in your interactions with children and with families to be very aware of that, that the very, um, from the minute they walk in the door with all their stuff, it's a very artificial setting. It's a very um, unnatural setting. And so how do we normalize that as a community of people who are here supporting each other and we live together and we play together, providing context for that and allowing them to ask questions and to talk about that. It can be hard, especially if, if moms told them something else. As much as possible, trying to normalize the whole context can be really significant. Um, and so these are things that we've talked about, but the ways in which, um, ways in which shelter and set itself and the whole homeless service, um, the, whole, holy, <laughs> the whole idea of homeless services can be problematic. And same thing for, certainly all that can happen in shelter and the same thing can happen with supportive housing as well. Um, if people are housed in areas where there's a high crime rate, uh, if they went, we had families that went from very rural settings where they had a big backyard and they had a swing set and they were housed in you know, the third story of an apartment building. And so the whole, it was just, it was just shocking to them, the lack of space, the noise all around them, um, the neighborhood, that whole idea was totally new to them and just felt like loss. Um, a place where they could have pets and now they can't have pets, a place where they were very close to family and now they're not close to family, where they have to have a new school, where their therapist is different, um, their doctor is different, where the whole support system is different. With, a, with an adult, that can all be very challenging too, but adults typically, sometimes not in our homeless service prov providers, but typically the adults know that's happening. They are in some way feel like they're participating in the process. But for children who may feel like, wait a minute, what? We lived here, we lived here, we're here. And I don't know why, I don't know how that happened. I don't know where everyone else went. And I don't know if we're ever gonna see them again. That can all feel very forced. And again, that lack of control. Um, this is something that can be a weakness in our housing first model, um, 
I do trainings on housing first. I think there's a lot of wonderful things about housing first. This can be a weakness is that we can take a family and, and they engage the, ho the homeless services. Um, they engage homeless services. Here we are, we're a homeless family, we need help. And now homeless services, the very first thing we're thinking right is housing first, housing first. We've got to get them housed. We've got to get them housed. And what we can do, <coughs> which can again be a very good thing, is immediately get a family housed, but not be able to um, assess where are these children, right? Are they developmentally, have, have they reached their developmental milestones? Are they progressing? Are they experiencing these symptoms of trauma? Um, how are they going to do in this new neighborhood? Will they get the same support that they had here? Will they get support they've never had but always needed? And so we can really assume that the family will somehow figure all of that out as soon as they get housed. Once they get housed, they'll figure it out. And that can be a real weakness of housing first if they're not, um, if they're not ever being evaluated, if they're ever being talked to, if there's not ever any way to figure out what that family needs because we're trying to house them so quickly. So that's something we have to be careful about. Um, so the, the impact of the whole of all of that shift on the child can in and of itself be traumatizing. So as much as possible, allowing children room to have control, room to make choices, to be heard, even if even it's just to be heard. What do you think about your new room? What do you think about it being here? Places to express um, and, and to have voice. So let's talk now about um, what can sometimes be a real, really feel like almost a conflict, and that is balancing the needs of the child and the needs of the family. Um, sometimes, as those of us who are children's counselors or children's program directors or um, over family services, you know, we can feel profoundly the need to think about what the child needs, and we can feel profoundly that that is not the family's primary concern, or that that, chi those, that child's needs may actually um, conflict with what's best for the family overall. Um, very often, just that, just that looking at a family and going, I don't know if this family can take care of this child, you know, feeling that tension of, should I call children's services? Um, they already have a case with children's services. Should, you know, that tension is a very real issue, um, I think, for most of us in the situation that, that you're in on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it can be very tempting, um, and sometimes this happens when you don't mean for it to, but it can be very tempting to replace the parent um, so that you are focused on the child and on meeting the child's needs and, and you are doing that instead of the parent doing that. So instead of supporting the parent so that the parent will take care of the child, especially sometimes in the role that we're in, we feel profoundly that we're really just taking care of the child or that we need to, or that we should, or that we have to, um, which, is, which is a very slippery slope in the work that we're doing. Um, so again, sometimes this happens and you didn't intend to it, in, intend for it to, but you realize when you're spending a lot of time with the child, or even if it's just an hour a week, that that child trust you more than their parent, that, that they love you more than their parent, that they wish you were their parent, um, that they want to stay with you and they want you to take care of them. And they, this is a very difficult aspect of working with children in trauma and children with attachment issues and children who never, um, or who don't attach to their own parent and are looking for someone to fill that hole. And here you come in and you love them and you care about them and you're meeting their needs and yet you're temporary. Um, and so that, that can be a source of trauma. I'm sure I've, I've had children that on the day they left the shelter, they were holding onto my leg, they were screaming and crying. It was just, and here I am. And I, and I know this is another level of trauma for this child. Um, and yet, you know, that's what I was, I was supposed to be taking care of that child, you know? So this is something we always have to kind of be aware of. And ultimately our goal is, is to empower the family, is to support the parent so that the parent can take care of the child. And we should always be pointing the child back to their parent. Even if the parent is really struggling, um, the parent, again, unless we're, unless we're calling DCS, unless we're calling Department of Children's Services, unless something else, you know, unless it's negligent, then that's not the case. But the parent, 
more than likely, hopefully, is going to be the long-term caregiver. And so the parent has got to be the one doing all of that. So we've got to constantly be pointing that child back to the parent. Um, how, what, how can I be supportive? How can I help you um, with what you need? How can I be a source of inspiration and hope and goodness and even love? And yet I don't become your primary source of stability because I'm not gonna be permanent, right? There will be a day when you and I don't see each other anymore. Um, and so constantly balancing that in a way that, um, that doesn't end up becoming another source of trauma. And again, that's, that, that happens. Sometimes we can't help that from happening. So that's not, you know, we have to extend grace to ourselves there. Um, sometimes we make that worse and we, and, you know, we're just trying to help and, and we take a real ownership there. So constantly doing that. There's been research done, and I meant to cite the study here and I didn't, but there's been research done that would indicate that the number one indicator, the number one indicator of a child's emotional stability, the number one way that you can tell if a child is emotionally stable is by the emotional stability of their primary caregiver. In most of the studies, it was done on mothers, so it was the mother. So if mom's okay, even if they're homeless, even if there's um, even if there's incarceration in the family, even if um, even if there's severe mental illness, if mom is okay, that is the number one indication that the child will be emotionally stable. So a lot of times we we spend a lot of time focusing on the child, which is good. A lot of services directed to the child to help the child um, be emotionally secure. When the reality is, if we focus a lot of time with mom and mom is okay the child will be okay. And again, I'm, I'm saying the primary caregiver, the, the studies that I've looked at it, they just did studies on the mom, but, but that primary caregiver. So, so it's very important that we not, even, even though we may be frustrated with mom, even when we think, why aren't you, why aren't you, right? <clears throat> that if we can make sure that mom and dad are okay, that will filter down to the child being okay, as opposed to all of our energy being focused on helping the child deal with this trauma, right? That's a much bigger conversation. A strengths-based approach. What does this family have going for them? Even families in some of the most difficult situations have things going for them, have, have advantages, have strengths. So what is the strengths that this mom has? What strengths does this family have? What strengths does this teenager have? Man, let's blow on that flame, right? Let's, let's keep that going. Let's really focus on that. And then always, always, always safety planning. And we'll do a different uh, I don't know if it's in this series, but we will do a different session on safety planning. Safety planning is so important. Constantly safety planning, constantly safety planning. So what else in your experience, uh, what else can we do to support the family as a whole? Um, what are some things or things that we do that may not support the family as a whole? Can you think about examples, illustrations, uh, maybe you've, how, how this has worked in your shelter or how this has gone badly or times this has been hard? What are challenges that you faced um, in supporting the family versus just the child? Um, sometimes even funders that can be difficult with how your programs have to be um, have to be uh, structured. What are, what are your thoughts around that? Well, something to think about, something to think about um, and how that balance looks like, maybe something to talk to your team about, something to kind of brainstorm about um, and how do we, how we focus our energy and how we offer that support. So as we close, this is my last slide. Um, I think, nope, one more. Uh, we're gonna, but last topic is thinking about secondary trauma. And um, signs, so we're, if, we're, if we're all day, every day, or even if it's just a couple times a week where we're meeting with, with children who are experiencing, um, who've experienced traumatic events, um, we know, and I'm sure that, that you're aware of this, I'm sure this is something that your agency has probably talked about too, is um, we certainly know that that trauma can eventually impact us. It can impact, uh, we, can, we can begin to feel as if we experience that trauma ourselves. And 
Um, so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. This is a big topic. Hopefully, this is something that that you give thought to. But I do want to. I don't want to talk about all that and not and not think about this. And even as, to be honest, even as I was putting this training together and and remembering some of these um, children and rem remembering specific scenarios, um, there there was part of me that wanted to just go. I don't want to think about that. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to get into that. And 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 a little bit of really wanting to avoid that. Um, there are there are many movies I don't watch and books I don't read because it it reminds there's a movie out I think on Netflix now about a family going through domestic violence and I just saw the advertisement on Facebook like oh I'm never watching that you know I just I just don't I don't want to open all those doors and and all the memories that brings in and and you know um, because it, it it that impacted me you know, I I cared about there there are children that I have cared about deeply. And, and I'm not, I'm not sure that they're okay. Um, and so, and so how do we find that balance? I, you know, we don't want to be, I don't, I, I visit shelters across the state and, and sometimes across the country. And there are, there are people that I meet that have become very hard hearted and nothing bothers them. Um, nothing, nothing ever affects them. I met with someone a couple of years ago and I walked into there, it was a large shelter and I walked up to the shelter. And as I walked up, um, there had been a, a big fight in the shelter just as I was pulling in and the police were bringing out um, a gentle, a young, a young man, a teenage boy. And they, um, and he was, and he was fighting them. And so they, um, they held him down onto the ground and they were handcuffing him behind his back. And he was, you know, he was screaming and other people were screaming. It was terrible. And just as I was walking up into all that, the staff member that I was going to meet with was walking up too. And the staff member said, hey, I'm, I'm going to get a cup of coffee and I'll be right there with you. Uh, probably going to need about five minutes. Well, I don't know. Let's just go on in. And he walked over the leg of the child, kind of pushed past the, the, the screaming uh, people. And it, it was like nothing at all. I mean, he had no impact on him at all. Um, and sometimes we can think that's a good thing. Hey, nothing really bothers me. Nothing really phases me. Whatever. It's another day at work. But we don't want to get to the part to point where where we can't feel anything and where nothing can impact us. On the other side of that spectrum, we also don't want to get to the point where um, we're crying every day, right? Where I can't cope, where I'm not sleeping, where I'm not eating, where I, you know, where I really despair of life. So, so having ways um, that we monitor our own emotional health and all of this is really significant too. So some warning signs that we may be experiencing secondary trauma, that, that this work, however you want to phrase it, that um, the relationships, the work we're engaging in, the people that we're meeting, the way we're doing it may be, um, may be affecting us in ways that could be unhealthy or that could, could not be great for us, right? When I leave work, so here's some warning signs. Here are just some kind of red flags to kind of create pause. When I leave work, do I still think about, is there a specific child or family that I still think about? Um, that I realize when I'm making dinner, oh, I wonder what they're having for dinner. Or, uh, oh, uh, you know, um, Susan, Susie would love this. Um, when I go, I take my children to the zoo on the weekend, do I think about what, what specific children, what animals they, they do I, you know, do I have these pop-in thoughts of, are they okay? Um, am I waking up in the middle of the night going, I wonder if they're asleep? Um, where, you know, that, that child, that family has become a part of me, a part of my routine that I'm not, that when I leave work, I'm taking them with me. And that, that's gonna happen some just because we're people and, and we remember things and things pop into our mind. But, but if that's happening to a point where, you know, I, I really can't turn that off, where the, the, that child or maybe a specific child is very, very often what happens, a specific child, I think about them all the time and I wonder if they're okay. Um, are there parents that I resent, um, that I uh, hate that parent, that I, I'm angry at that parent. Oh, you know, uh, that I find myself maybe passively aggressively not helping that parent or um, do I have negative feelings around a parent because I have taken an ownership of their child that's not healthy. Um, I, I'm angry because they're not taking care of their child. And, and there is, again, with all these things, there's, there's a little bit of a healthy component of that right? Certainly there's a, there's a righteous indignation. I can't believe this is happening, but I've made it very personal. I'm not okay when I think about that parent. Do I mistrust other staff or the program or outside referrals with the child and see myself as the best or only resource 
for this child or this family. So again, I've become possessive. Uh, no, I'll take care of that myself. I, I'm really the only one, you know, they, they really only talk to me. That should be a huge red flag. If you are the only hope for that family or that child, if that child or that family feels that way about you, that's a big red flag. Oh, we don't talk to anyone but Miss Cindy. We'll wait until Miss Cindy comes. Then when I walk in, they just unload on me, right? And then I fix it. Um, that's a big red flag that we've, we've gotten some unhealthy possessive issues going on there. <clears throat> Do I become emotional when I think about the child leaving the program? Again, I've, I've taken an ownership there. Do I think of myself as a parent to the child or to the family or to all the children? Um, am I everyone's auntie? Um, and again, I realize there maybe there's a healthy version of that, um, but that can become very unhealthy because these are children that, that you're not raising and that you can't take care of. You're temporary. And so if I begin to feel that sort of ownership, that sort of big, I, you know, I'm going to take care of everybody. Everybody expects me to take care of them. That's not sustainable. And so when someone, I come into work one morning and they're gone, <coughs> or they've been hospitalized, or they've been incarcerated, or they've been sent to foster care, then it's a personal failure because I was supposed to take care of them because I was auntie. Um, and, so, and so that's not sustainable as we do this work. Um, and so these are, these are ways of thinking um, that, that should be warning signs, um, that, that probably, probably can't in a healthy way keep thinking this way. Um, that's gonna really uh, cause a lot of stress in myself. So uh, more warning signs that uh, perhaps I'm uh, suffering from the effects of secondary trauma or compassion fatigue, whatever you wanna call it, uh, changes in my own um, eating, sleeping feelings, uh, my, my own eating patterns, my own sleeping patterns, uh, what do I do when I'm really stressed out? Do I not eat at all? Do I eat a lot more? <laughs> do I uh, tend to have trouble sleeping? Am I sleepy all the time? Being very aware of my own warning signs, of my own, um, of my own kind of red flags. Um, how do I feel about coming to work or leaving work? And, and we all have days where we don't want to go to work. And we all have times where I wish, um, you know, I wish I didn't, didn't have to go, but am I absolutely dreading it? Or do I feel like I've got to get there as soon as possible and get things under control? I need to get there as soon as I can so that everyone will be okay. I don't really want to leave because I'm not sure everyone will be okay. I'm working extra hours because I've got to take care of everyone and I don't trust the other staff and I don't trust the process or the program. Um, Got to check that email, make sure they're still okay. I've got to check the on-call phone over and over and over. Are they okay? Are they okay? Are they okay? Right? Um, these are these are big red flag warning signs. If your agency is expecting you specifically to do that, um, that's a you know, that, that's a problem. That's uh, that's not sustainable. I don't think. If my own emotional stability, you know, I, I'm I'm crying more or I'm sad more. I'm angry all the time, I feel frustrated all the time, that can be a warning sign. Um, if I feel like I'm sort of disassociating, so I come to work, but it's like I'm watching myself on television. Um, I don't really feel engaged with anyone. I feel very separated from the work that I'm doing and the conversations that I'm having. Um, I Maybe I lack the ability to feel anything, no matter what anyone says, I just kind of feel like, hmm, all right, whatever, that's okay, now that, now that, right? Um, all of those can be warning signs. It can be helpful to know um, what kinds of situations are particularly difficult for me. Um, and so um, sometimes with this work, uh, you may realize, I, I realize there, there are specific scenarios that are really difficult for me. And, and, and so understanding that, that there may be some family dynamics that um, you really kind of breeze through and you kind of see the problems and you help with resources and you connect the dots. And there may be other family dynamics that you go, oh, wow, that's really sad. Um, it may be something that you experienced in your past. 
Um, it may be something that a loved one experienced, you know, for whatever reason, there may be certain scenarios that just really impact you. Um, and so knowing those scenarios so that you can be prepared for that can be really, can be really, really helpful. And so that you can debrief it with other people. And so having this personal support system, and this, this, this may not be from work. This may not be people at your work. You may work in a place. I worked in places where if I told my supervisor, man, I, I've just had nightmares every night this week, ever since I did that intake last week, or, um, Ever since you know we we had that woman you know have a seizure uh, in withdrawal, uh, man, I've just I just can't get it out of my head. That if I told my supervisor that, I would be sent to mandated counseling, or I would be suspended. Uh, you just weren't you, you just it wasn't a safe place to say that. They were going to say, okay, well then maybe you're not fit to do this work, right? And so um, so it may be that you have to have that support system outside of work. I've also had friends that if I came home from the shelter and I called my best friend and said, oh my goodness, you won't believe the story. I, you won't believe what I heard today. My friend was gonna have a nightmare, right? My friend couldn't handle it. And so having that support system around you of people that you can debrief with who aren't gonna be damaged by the stories you tell. Um, people who know you well, um, whether that's whoever that is. Um, but, but establishing that kind of support system when you do this level, when you're dealing with this level of trauma every day is really, really important. People who can say to you, hey, I noticed you just ate a bag of Oreos. Everything okay? Hard day at work? You know, seems like you haven't been sleeping well, whatever it is, someone who can help point that out in you and make sure that you're coping well. What are some things, and this is personal, so it may not, feel free to share. I'm not gonna um, camp out on this a long time, but, is, but are, there, are there things that you've done that have helped you to cope uh, with working with, with children in trauma? Are there things that you've done that you found, yeah, that, that really helps me to set good boundaries, a way of thinking, um, some, something that you do. Is there anything else that others have found that, that's been really helpful? One thing that, one really practical thing that I've done um, that I still do sometimes <clears throat> in different situations is to, is to remind myself that, um, that I'm not the solution. And so it's been really helpful to me to realize if I had all the money in the world, if I had all the money in the world and I gave it to this family that I care about, this family that I'm trying to help, it still, it still wouldn't solve all their problems. If I stayed with them, if I moved them into my house, I've done this. Uh, sometimes I have teenagers who are homeless who stay with me, uh, stay with my husband and I and our children. And if I move them into my house, if I stay with them 24 seven, it still won't solve all their problems. And so sometimes it's very helpful to me to realize that, that I am not the solution. Maybe you don't ever feel that way. Maybe I'm just that arrogant enough that I have to remind myself of that. Um, maybe you've never struggled to think that. But sometimes I think, you know, I need, I'm going to go home, I'm going to take care of my children. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to shut the door because the reality is I've done what I can. I've done, I've done what I can today. Um, I'm, I've done what I'm paid to do, what I'm contracted to do. I've done, I've done what I can within the parameters of the time I have. Um, even if I stayed all day, I am not this family's solution. That would be a very artificial, artificial, unnatural, dysfunctional thing if they looked at me and I solved all their problems. Um, and so I, when I leave a shelter or a family that I'm working with through our church, you know, that I really, that I care about, that I'm trying to help, and I leave and I shut that door, um, I, I just picture in my head the door shutting and, um, and for me, this is, this is around God. It may be whatever it is you picture as, as a force that controls, you know, a force of goodness, a force of love, a force that, that's in control. For me, for me I, I, I have a faith-based way of looking at that, however you look at that. But I'm shutting the door and I'm gonna have to go home. But there is a goodness and a love and um, a hope that stays there with that family. 
even though I drive away. I am not their source of love and support and goodness. I've done what I can. There is a love and a support and a goodness that stays with that family and that continues to move in that family's life. And I'm, it's not dependent on me. That's something that I do that, um, that's, that's very, very helpful to me. When I have to leave a situation um, that feels very sad and hopeless to me, that there's um, a source of hope and goodness that goes beyond me. And so I hope that's something that will be really helpful um, as you think about children and trauma in general um, and think about the families that you work with. Um, you are certainly a source of that goodness and hope. And, um, and then for some of the families that, you know, there are children that you're working with today that will look back over life and, and you will be part of, that, part of that hope and goodness that they received. You'll be a part of their story. And that's a unique opportunity that, that you all have. Uh, as we close out, just a reminder that uh, we're gonna do, um, this is again, we're, we're really trying to hope, uh, specifically those in the state of Tennessee that we're really trying to re-engage with shelters. If there's anything that we can do with, uh, to support you as you help families with TennCare, please feel free to reach out um, and you'll have the registration for next month. Feel free to reach out with questions. It was very good to see you all today. Thank you so much for the work that you do. And we will be in touch again next month if you'd like to join us again.